Welcome Wargamers, today we're going to continue our coverage of the Asiarch Bone Reapers by exploring all the leaders in this faction. Now I've already covered the, the big like heavy hitters, right, Arcan, Nagash, and Catacros in their own dedicated video, so if you want to see those, just search my channel for them. But today I wanted to focus on those smaller heroes that make up this army. And like a lot of GW armies these days, the heroes really define the characteristics of the entire force, right? They, how they contribute to that army is so tied to the nature of the faction as a whole. So in this video, we have two named heroes and a whole bunch of more generic ones. As always, some of them have more art and lore than others. I'll be sure to post pictures of the models here as I can, just so you know which unit we're talking about. So let's kick this off with our named heroes. First up is Arch Cavalos Xantos. Born Patru Xantos, he and Catacros the Mortark go way back, knowing each other in life, living in the same tribe, right? That Fleitch is how I'm pronouncing it, tribe. And one important thing to note about Xantos is the nature of his soul. While others are ripped up amalgamations of other souls that we've talked about before with all the other Ossiarchs, their souls are just as much constructs as their bodies, Xantos was allowed to remain intact. He is who he always has been, and that is extremely unique. Frequently in, this, in these kinds of books and battle tomes and Black Lad Ride novels, uh, they'll, they'll paint you a picture of the norm for an army and then give you a character who goes against that grain and it makes them pop off the page. Well, the Arch Cavalos is top general of the Mortark's army, right? Second only to Catacros himself. And even in his like completed soul state, right? He's completely unchanged. He has no ambition to rise above his post. He likes being second in command. And so how does someone end up in this position if they aren't like one of those like composite souls where it's a bunch of pieces of the best of the best put together? Well, in life, Xantos was known as an assassin mortician, right? Picture an assassin that's obsessed with being neat and tidy, respectful and orderly. He would kill a victim, of course, he's an assassin, but then do the full mortician business, right? Make the body presentable, tidy, complete the burial, dig a grave, give some last rites. It spawns from a deep respect for death and the dead and a skill set that just so happens to be good at facilitating people becoming dead. So a very ordered and professional person. While I wouldn't call him like obsessive compulsive, he was a person deeply concerned with everything being ordered and structured, right? That there was like this way that things just ought to be within the universe. Or he considered himself a purist and eschewed all distractions from his work. Kind of like we mentioned that with Catacross, where even from an early age, he just didn't like recreational things. Now, the Battle Tome says that he did this craft for 60 years. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was 60 when he died. He could have been a little bit older. Maybe he started the profession when he was a little bit older. But that means, at bare minimum, he still had a pretty long life, right? Unlike Catacross, he didn't have the same epic death story. It might have just been a peaceful, relatively old ending to a man. And when he did die, he arrived in his people's afterlife of Asia. And remember from our first video, uh, or sorry, the Catacross video, this is the, the Flitchian afterlife that is based around satisfying labor. And he found this to be his liking. There were things to do. The countryside was neat and orderly. There was peace and it was just calm in his heart. This was like the perfect afterlife for him. However, that all changed once Sigmar came. Now, I assume this is, of course, in the Age of Myth, as the Pantheon was being, like, seeded and grown, life was being spread amongst the realms. The living had spread far and wide in Shaiish, rival kingdoms fighting for dominance, making noise, filth, and disrespect for the afterlife, because after battlefields right, are, are left, you know, over those battles, there's, like, dead bodies strewn across everywhere, carrion birds pecking at them, just kind of wrecking this orderly afterlife that Xantos wanted. And it sent him into an absolute uproar for a few reasons. The first one being very clear, he they disrespected the dead, right? He spent so much of his life honoring the fallen that to see the careless disposal of corpses was an absolute affront to his personal reverence. Secondly, this tide of the living in Shayish conflicted with his sense of order, right? Shayish is for the dead. The living here are like a round peg in a square hole. They don't belong here, it belongs to us. So in response, Xantos goes on a one-man crusade to kill all the living in Shaiish, 
of course starting in his home country of Ossia. And remember, Ossia does have a military, but at this point it's meant to be defensive, that is until Catacross rises to take control of it. The two meet this time in undeath, and the rage and fervor of Xantos is a tool that is used by Catacross. And this kind of innate desire for peace and order, right, peace meaning everyone's dead so there's no one bothering you or making a mess, made Xantos a fine leader. He was efficient, he was brutal, and he was unyielding. And this was only magnified when Catacross gifted him a weapon called the Dark Lance. Sort of think of it as like a, a magic blade, right? It's an arcane weapon that magnifies the wielder's intention. So when you're wielding it, whatever you're singularly focused on, you kind of fall into madness about that singular thing. And when he gave it to Xantos, his hands magnified the desire to purge the living and push back Sigmar's influence and reclaim Shyish for the dead. So that's his number two guy, the guy who just wants to exterminate all the living from Shyish. And remember that Xantos represents kind of like the military arm of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. The other units we'll talk about later on represent more of like the supporting role. So you want your military guy to be solely focused on his one job, not being distracted by anything else. Next up is Valk Mortian. Master of the Bone Tie. This is an interesting one for sure. He's the he's the leader who came in the Feast of Bone set that I'm sure one day will be released by his elf in a clan pack or something. And even though he's in the same legion as Xantos and Catacros, neither of them are given even the briefest of mention in his entry. And that's because Volk Morton is first and foremost a servant of Nagash, right? Being his foremost emissary. Nagash can actually see through Volkmortian's eyes and make his presence known by kind of reaching out through his chest. And that's why if you see that picture where uh, Volkmortian has like a kind of greenish huey ghoul coming out of his chest, that's actually the appearance of Nagash peeking through. It's a very unique and peculiar role, right? He's, he's the statesman emissary, but also a conqueror. It's him and his underlings that go far and wide decreeing the Bone Tithe, gathering resources for the Bone Reaper's Dark Harvest. And as his role of emissary would make sense, he bears the authority of Nagash. So if he comes across another undead army, like let's say for example, uh, in some bits of the Legions of Nagash book, there were like little death rattle kingdoms. If they come upon a death rattle kingdom, he immediately has the authority to take command and control it. And so his entry is kind of an odd one, right? It's, it's almost written like he's a Mortark, Right? It's that level of importance, but he isn't really. He's more like a diplomat, a representative, with a lot of authority and power. But he's not given the role of leading anything in particular. Like, you know, Mortarks all have their own kind of like divisions, I guess you could say, of Nagash's army. He doesn't really do that, but he does embody the authority of Nagash in the realms. And it puts him in a really interesting place, as he is, in theory, below Catacross, or at least you know, kind of equal to Xantos, right? They're, they're, Catacross is the leader of this entire faction, right? Only second to Nagash. And Volkmordian kind of floats in terms of authority in this weird space outside of that. For everything being so highly structured and ordered, he seems to have a unique position. And I think this is chalked up to the fact that they are just very different roles, like they're different heads of the same snake. Catacross is the militant mind, whereas Volkmordian represents Nagash's long-term interests. If we want to do this long-term and make this work, we have to collect enough raw material to make the biggest army possible, and that's why he's responsible for the Bone Tithe. Now, that's it for the named characters, and we're going to jump into kind of the various roles of the unnamed one. As always, some have more lore than others, but each of them has an incredibly unique role within the army. Starting off with the Liege Cavaloy. Think of this as the like generic version of Xantos, right? He's a hero on a Kavalos uh, steed, which is the mount. And as we mentioned before, the souls of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers are all, universally except for Xantos uh, and Catacros, a composite, right? Meaning that Nagash took the best qualities from the dead heroes around the realms, tore them apart, mashed them together into one new identity with the best of the best, and he kind of put a cap on their individuality. In life, the souls that would become uh, a single liege cavaloi uh, were inspiring leaders of renown. Those who could turn the tide of battle with their feats of strength, charisma, and sheer force of will. Right? Think 
the Pattons and Churchills of our own history, something like that, right? Rallying soldiers to enormous feats of strength and achievement. In Undeath, all mashed together, they fill a very similar role. These are commonly the generals of large detachments of the army, capable of charging headlong into an enemy until it is absolutely eradicated. They're incredibly aggressive, and they focus on speed and deadly efficiency, often commanding the cavalry of an army to act as sort of a largely independent flanking force, right? And this flanking force comes around to the side, smashes into the heart of the enemy, and then when he's in the heart of it, he's able to like project his presence to his men and inspire them to greater acts of savagery. And so now we're gonna move away from the kind of the strictly militant aspects of the army into those that make the faction function. That culmination of accountants, engineers, and masons we talked about in the first episode, right? The force that's behind Catacros, fueling his endless war machine, but also needing him to wield it. The most basic of these support heroes is the Mortison Bone Mason. These are the craftsmen of Nagash's apocalypse, right? Or able to take ordinary bones, break it down like clay, reform it into the hardened and deadly form that are the building blocks of the Asiarch Bone Reaper soldiers and society. When Nagash was looking to create this tier of craftsmen, right, he searched all of Shayesh, pulling many souls from an afterlife known as Anadiria. An afterlife for artisans, artists, craftsmen, engineers, things like that, right? Where they could peacefully practice their trades to perfection for eternity. Building these great monuments and sculptures and more. Ripped from this paradise, Nagash has torn these souls apart and put their efforts and their skills to the sole creation of his unyielding war machine. On the battlefield, they can repair damaged soldiers, they can like reattach an arm or legs that's been in on, you know, taken off of an injured fighter. And post-battle, they can be found reconstituting the bones of the defeated, able to create a new warrior's body in just minutes. They are often seen hanging out near the Gothazar Harvester, which we'll cover in another video, trying to get a sense of what materials, like the quantities that they'll be able to work with. In addition to creating the physical form for the Osiarch Bone Reaper's soldiers at the individual units on the ground, they're also responsible for crafting the immense fortresses and bone-tithe nexuses of the faction. So everything is based upon bones, right, as, as their building material. Every fortification, every building, every wall, and every soldier is built from this. So these guys are incredibly important and very plentiful within a legion. Which is weird. It kind of puts them in a strange place where they kind of fill this role of medic because they're like fixing everybody, right? They're a medic, they're an engineer, and they're an artisan all in one. And I love that combination that because everything's based off the same material, when you are the person who can craft that material with ease, you suddenly fill a bunch of different roles. Now, right below them are the Mortison Soul Reapers. A lot of these sound the same, so just kind of be careful when you're looking up the entries here, but the Soul Reapers, are very interesting. See, where, where the Bone Shapers are designed to create and build, like we just talked about, the Soul Reapers are designed to destroy. Formed from the composite souls of like necromancers or people who tried to wield death magics, they are often considered the least among the Mortisons. The Mortisons kind of being like that whole class that is about like supporting the army and that kind of thing. And even though they have power, it's not the power to create like the rest of their order has. Their design is simple. It's just to kill. In the death of the enemy, by melee or by destructive magics, their job is to release the souls, right, the raw animus energy of life and capture it for later use. This being an, like an essential ingredient to the Osiarch Bone Reaper process. It's not just bones. They're built upon bones, obviously, but everything has to be animated. All those souls that they take to, or that are torn apart and put into a soldier, they come from somewhere. And on the battlefield, these are the soldiers who bring them to our next entry, which we'll talk about here in a second. But they go into battle as if they were these like grim farmers reaping the crop to fuel the war machine, right? Creating dead bodies, which of course means more bones, and freed souls and the raw animus energy that there's used for making new spirits to inhabit those bodies. Where the Gothazar Harvester collects the raw bone material for bone shapers, these collect the soul energies for crafting by the next entry, which is the Mortison Soul Masons. 
an incredibly important part of any Ossiarch Bone Reaper Legion. It's the highest strength of the Mortisons in any given army that you're going to find, and the pinnacle of that calculating evil we mentioned in the first episode, complete with a great deal of autonomy and a sharp mind to use it. Quite simply put, these are the heroes that create those composite souls we've been talking about all week. They animate the empty bodies created by the Bone Shapers, and just as a gun is no use without bullets, a perfectly sculpted Ossiarch Bone Reaper warrior is nothing without an equally engineered soul to turn into a deadly weapon. During a battle, the Soul Masons will be very busy, right? They'll seem, seem kind of incredibly aloof, as if they're like daydreaming or something like that, but they're actually hard at work. All of their work is mental. Because unseen to everyone, but with like, you know, spirit or ghost sight, however you want to call that, they're taking souls of the dead as they're dying in battle, evaluating their worth, tearing them apart, and reconstituting them as needed. They are the on-scene arbiter of what a worthy soul is, deciding what aspects are useful, what can we use, what do we need to discard. Taking the best that the realms have to offer and morphing these bits into a set of single consciousnesses infusing it into soul gems kind of thing that adorn every Ossiarch Bone Reaper soldier. They're more than just like a necromancer that traps a soul and reanimates something. They really are creators, right? Progenitors of entire armies, right? The entire beings that have their own thoughts and abilities and stuff like that. It's, it's a huge task. And to allow them to focus entirely on their work, they frequently create these mounts that autonomously steer them into battle. These are the, like the bipedal constructs they ride into war. Not everyone digs the model, I totally understand that. But you know, in, in, from a lore perspective, if you didn't know what it looked like, I think it sounds super cool. And having that, that autonomous you know, vehicle carry them around allows them to dedicate the entirety of their mind to the judgment of souls. Right? How many soldiers can be yielded from this battle? How many are we going to lose? What are the roles we need to fill for the next campaign and so on. And that is it for the heroes of the army outside of the, the big heavy hitters, Nagash, Arcan, and Catacross we already covered elsewhere. So why are these units specifically so cool? Well, the last several armies that Games Workshop has released, at least the new ones anyway, right, where it's all totally new, 100%, they've been defined by a few unit kits, but a strong emphasis on heroes, right? These linchpins to make the army play thematically and efficiently and they add flavor and character and synergies and all of that. And I think they really nailed it here, right? Nagash is about an efficient, ends justify the means kind of plan and there's no fat in this hero selection. Everyone either leads the beast, meaning the military guys, or feeds it. Xantos and the Cavaloy lead this war engine to battle, right? Conquest to see that vision of Nagash fulfilled but it takes so much more than just military strategy to do something as audacious as completely conquering the realms. And that's where the Mortisons come in. Their ability to create soldiers, repair them, custom craft souls for them to meet the exact needs of the moment all on the fly is incredible. And it keeps the snowball growing instead of the army kind of burning out as the dead are depleted. It also means that they are able to fight in a wide variety of kind of environments, right? If they need some heavy hitters because they're fighting against a Maw tribe, they can just on the fly create some of the larger units we'll talk about in the next video. If they're getting overrun, they just need more bodies, smaller guys to help defend all the leaders, they can do that. They can keep making more Mortec Guard. It allows them to be independent, incredibly adaptable, and self-sustaining. And in this way, all together, right, a legion with a full complement of these heroes can act with true autonomy abroad in the realms. And I say autonomy, of course, with the caveat that all of them are just hardwired to follow Nagash's every word. But I mean, they never need reinforcements. They don't need necromancers to summon more dead or gunpowder to reload their guns. They don't need food or water supply lines. They are a self-contained entity bent on destruction that grows and grows the more it's allowed to survive, because by surviving it's killing other things, gathering bones, getting bigger. And this just represents one of these legions, there's dozens at least, right, with more being created all the time. And because of that, all of these leaders together represent the long game of Nagash, right? Each of these armies, growing slowly over time, spread far and wide, multiplying the whole time, because you're always adding more. It's the longest of the long games bent on slowly choking life out of the realms. 
these snowballs of their army, I keep calling that because they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the more they kill, the, you know, the more numerous they can become. That's how Nagash envisioned it ending. This slow, tedious plotting takes millennia and they're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until all of a sudden nothing can stand in their way and everything is dead. Now, side note to this, I gotta say, my absolute favorite is the Bone Shaper. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, what is it, the units from the Eldar in 40k, where they can, like, craft all of the, the buildings and that kind of stuff from their, like, Wraith Bone thing, where they kind of, like, just have this artisan that can come out and just, you know, turn, take a, a, almost like a natural resource and form it to their will. I really like that idea, almost as if they're playing with clay. Uh, the idea of them just hanging out next to the Gothazar Harvester to, like, check out how many bones they got and, like, what are we working with today? I don't know. Kind of gives it, like, a um, Iron Chef kind of feel when you don't know what ingredients you're going to have. You just kind of make it up as you go and make it work moment type deal. I love it. So I think he's a really cool unit. Plus, that model is absolutely sick. Tell me, which one is your favorite hero? And what do you think about the soul mason i personally like it i like the bipedal thing uh his position when he's sitting and it's like walking him around i love the lore behind him he's actually my favorite lore wise being like the head of the mortisons but i know not everyone was super hot on that model but i want to hear your thoughts tell me in the comments below and i'll see you in my next age of sigmar lore video thank you so much for watching and happy wargaming